Hello, welcome to At Home with Olivia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate your being in the virtual room with us. I am Terry Lindelk, Olivia's entertainment and production manager. Um, before we get into this, please take a moment to smash that share button. If you showed up, you know this is truly a historical epic event and you're gonna wanna make sure you share it with your community. Um, just a little bit about At Home with Olivia. Um, we started doing these shows in March of 2020. And since then, we've done over 100 shows. We started doing these shows to foster our sense of community with our community um, while we're not being able to travel together. Um, also, we are doing it to bring visibility to our artists who are truly the glue to our community. Um, Today's show is a little bit different in that we don't have artists that have a virtual tip jar, but we will be talking with two of Olivia's founding mothers. So to get into the show, in 1973, a group of friends and radical lesbian feminists decided to change the world by creating Olivia Records. Today, some 48 years later, Two of the founders are reflecting on the how and the why they did it and how it impacted the women's musical, cultural, and political movements that changed the world for generations of women to come. Now, sit back and re relax as we get the inside scoop. So please welcome Ju Judy DeLugach and Jenny Burson. Jenny. Hi, everybody. Hi, Judy. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Terry um, Lynn. Can you believe we're doing this? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. This is the I first am. time we've ever done this. I know. Actually. I know. So uh, hi, everybody. I am. Um, I'm Judy. And I just wanted to start out by um, telling you a little bit about what we think we're going to do. And um, then I also want to mention to you that uh, Ginny called me a few weeks ago and said, wouldn't it be great to uh, have this conversation? And she has just finished this amazing book, which I read cover to cover again this weekend. And it is Olivia on the record. I want to get this right. A radical experiment in women's music. And uh, this is the original collective. After the first 10, a, a year after that, we became, we became five and we were the living and working collective. And so here we are, aren't we cute? I just wanted everyone to be able to see how adorable we were in 1973. Okay, um, that's Jenny, me. This is backwards, so I'm having trouble. Meg, Kate, uh, Kate and Jennifer. That's okay. right, you got it. Okay, um, the thing I want to mention is that Ginny and I decided we would do this without a moderator or someone asking us questions because I think we felt like we could maybe ask each other and just see how the whole thing goes as we go along. Because, um, and also I wanted to also mention that we are going to, um, at about 45 minutes, 50 minutes into it, we will ask you if you would like to uh, add your questions. So if you would put them in chat around that time, then Terry Lynn can go through and pick some out and we can try to answer some of them if we haven't already. So I am totally excited um, to have this opportunity to go back to the very beginning of Olivia with uh, really Ginny, who was absolutely so instrumental in the, those first early years. Um, she talks a lot about it in her book. Um, Anyone, honestly, anyone who's interested in lesbian feminism and radical lesbianism and Olivia Records and Olivia as a company, we've had a 50, almost 50 year trajectory. 
And so we will be talking a lot about the early Olivia Records days, and I may be throwing in a little bit of the, uh, after that first period, what, what happened. So on that note, um, let's start. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Judy. <laughs> so I, when, we, when we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, Judy said something to me that um, really interested me, intrigued me, and I wanted to ask her about it. I wanted to ask you about it. But I realized that in order to do that, I need to do a little, a little more context setting so that you all know what, what we're talking about here. Um, so I'm gonna just repeat a little bit of what um, Terry Lynn said. It was January 73, Washington, DC. We were self-defined radical lesbian feminists um, and we had our first meeting. And um, I had was one of the women who had come from the Furies Collective, a newspaper. Judy had just moved to DC with some friends from Ann Arbor. So when we had the, the first meetings of what became Olivia Records, we hardly knew each other. And that's kind of important. Um, but we decided we were gonna do a national women's record company um, in spite of the fact that we knew absolutely nothing about the recording industry or how to run a business, um, but we knew how to be radical lesbian feminists. And that was all that mattered. And our intentions were to produce high quality music by women that celebrated the fullness of women's lives, to create excellent jobs for women and to reach into the hearts of women everywhere through the great music and the non-exploitive ways of operating, which would result eventually in the overthrowing of the patriarchy and capitalism. We haven't quite done that yet. Over time, we produced dozens of albums. You know a lot of the folks, Meg Christian, Chris Williamson, Linda Tillery, uh, Diane Davidson, Teresa Trull, Mary Watkins, Deirdre McCalla, many, many others. But back in the summer of 73 and 74, um, we were finding it hard to do to be a lesbian feminist record company in Washington, D.C. Meg and I drove to uh, California. Uh, we drove to Los Angeles to see if that was a place that would be more conducive. And um, by that point, by the, and we decided it would, that LA was definitely a better place uh, for us to be than DC. Um, by that point, as Judy said, a, a lot of the women or early women had dropped out and, um, and then more dropped out when we said we wanted to move to LA. But Judy decided to move, which was a surprise actually. And when we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, Judy said to me, you know, it took a lot of courage to do this. And I said, I don't feel like it, it took courage for me to do it. And she said, well, I feel like it took courage for me. I feel like it was a brave thing to do. And so I want you to please say why. Yeah. Well, OK, so I was, you know, when we started living, I was at the ripe old age of 20. And when we, uh, when Jenny, Meg and Ginny said, um, we, we, we want the company to move to LA because it's really important for us to be there. And because the industry is there, because there's an incredible growing women's community there. We know uh, Chris and Margie are there and we just feel like this is the right thing for the company. And um, everybody else, we went around the room and everybody else said, no, I don't want to go. I'm not going, I'm going. And I, I watched myself as they went around the room. I had to sit there going, okay, what am I, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna do this? Gonna... And you know, it took about 10 minutes for everyone to go around the room and they got to me. I was the last and I said, yeah, I'm going because I knew it was the right thing for Olivia. And because I had already, I drank the Kool-Aid already. I already believed that this was so important and would make such a difference and this was my, was now my dream as well. So when we got into the elevator and you said to, you guys said to me, gee, you, you know, why? And I said, because it's the right thing for Olivia. And we, uh, you know, the, the thing that was the hardest was that I left everything. I didn't, you know, I knew Meg and Ginny, you know, to a degree, we were now, we had been working together for a while, but I didn't know them well. I certainly didn't know Kate and, Jennifer, who were the other two members of the of the Living Collective that moved to LA, and they were in then in Albuquerque for the most part. And so it was me and two couples who were older than me and also knew each other. So it was, um, you know, and I was now 22, 23, so I was a baby. And so to make that kind of decision 
I decided not to go to law school, which was that's right. Me, you know, I just my parents were not great um, supporters, and I left my girlfriend and I left my friends, and I just you know it was like a an, I call it an arranged marriage. It was an arranged marriage. We were living together, working together, being together, and ultimately, you know, it was a very amazing, amazing thing. And so for me, it was. You know, when I look back at that little kid, I, I which she, you know, was, um, it really meant a lot that to me to know that I had taken that step. It was a brave step. You guys, though you don't feel like it was such a brave step, it was a natural progression for what where you were at. For me, it was this giant leap of faith. But exactly. I loved what we were doing. And yeah, I still exactly. do fifth, almost 50 years later. Yeah, for mostly the same reasons. So, exactly. So that's my story. So, so I have something for you. Okay. Okay. So you, I know because you left Olivia. What was it? 80, 1980? 1980. Okay. So, and that was a very significant moment. Those were significant times. Those first eight years were, you know, led the way for everything else. And then you left. And pretty much you were gone and you had to come back and really think through this book. And I was so thrilled that you were doing it because I felt like you could, you know, you could only tell that specific parts of the story. And so um, my question to you is what was it like for you to go back to that early, those early times and, you know, where you yourself made such a, a radical difference in this world that we now have? Well, so first of all, I, I want to say a couple of things about that because first of all, it was, um, it was actually um, a lot of fun to go back. Um, one of the things that I had to do because memory being what it is or what it isn't, um, I had to, I, I needed to, to go back and talk to people to fill in some of the story. And, um, and so I got to reconnect with a lot of people that I hadn't really been in contact with since I left Olivia. And I heard some wonderful stories of stuff that I didn't even know had happened, or maybe I knew, but I had long forgotten it. Um, and it was very, it was, that was very exciting to me to get, to reconnect with people, to get these stories. There's a, a, a story about that Kim Johnson, who was the B.B. Karoche manager, told me about what it was like for B.B. Karoche, which was this, you know, kind of edgy, um, dikey uh, band, rock band in rural Oklahoma. And what they, how they had to get out of town in a hurry and just stuff I didn't know. So that was thrilling for me, all of that. And then I remembered, Judy, um, from partly from talking to people, but also from reading our um, meeting notes, because we took extensive uh, notes uh, at our meetings, how much fun we had with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we had the music and we had the concerts and we had the records and all of that was wonderful. But among ourselves, we had a lot of fun. We played a lot and we laughed a lot. And um, and it was amazing to me to realize how much we accomplished in such a short time. But there's something else too that 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 happened for me when I went back and did this, which um, I'm, I'm gonna do a little sidebar here because in the middle eighties in the Bay Area of California, there was, um, there, were, there was a women's bookstore and there were women picketing the bookstore all the time. And there was a, a women's music festival in California and there were women organizing a boycott against it. And I had a friend who was a, a lawyer who um, told me that she had gone to law school in order to defend uh, lesbians in custody cases, lesbian mothers in custody cases. But she was spending all of her time in court dealing with lesbians suing other lesbians. And this was very upsetting to me. And I just, I was in radio at the time. I wanted to do a, a radio show about it. And I contacted Bet Bettina Apthecker, who was a women's studies professor at UC Santa Cruz. And I asked her, why, why, does, why is this happening? And she said, this is what oppressed people do. 
and it's called horizontal hostility. And I had never heard that term before. And so when I went back to um, look at some of the things that we fought about, um, not necessarily with each other, but right. that people fought about with Olivia, that Olivia fought about with other people and realized how small the differences were and how at that point we didn't know how to call each other in. We only knew how to call each other out mm -hmm. and how I could look at these conflicts in a different light now. It was actually very healing for me. And so it was, uh, I mean, I was able to let go of whatever anger I was still holding. I was able to let go of whatever wounding I still had. So it was a, it was a great, um, it was a, actually all together, it was a great experience. And plus I love to write. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I really liked it. I mean, I, I, it was very, it was a very positive experience all the way around. So I just want us to go back there for a second because um, just to frame who we were and what it was like. I mean, I think that as a, so this, these five women moved into this one house together on Gramercy Drive in central LA and we, we left everything. We, we <laughs> took a U-Haul across the country. We left everything. Uh, our, you know, we quit our jobs and pooled our money and, uh, three days before we got there, Kate and Jennifer found a house that we could all live in and our animals were there. And, um, and we just uh, soon after, maybe a couple of weeks later, uh, the first record arrived. I know you know, Meg Christian, I know you know. And um, it was, a, yes, yes. We got into Visually. trouble because Meg was on a pedestal, but that's another story. We should yeah. have known that there might be a few issues that came up, but um, in general, after that. But um, the amazing thing about what we were doing is that we were in love with what we were doing. And yeah, we yeah. loved the music so much that we, you know, I think Jennifer said this once, we loved the music so much. How could, if we loved it this much, how could other women not love it as much as we did? And that was Meg, her first, who was an incredible performer, and then Chris. And so Meg's album came out and suddenly there was this, uh, you know, swell of excitement at, throughout the country. And that, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Meg and Ginny went around the country in the little, their little Toyota station wagon, Nell, which we named everything. <laughs> and um, they brought the music and they talked about it. And that was the beginning. And so word began to spread and, and, uh, we put little ads in feminist papers and did our, you know, did, um, people were thrilled, so excited because it was, you know, it was just a moment in time when women were just starting to come out and also be feminist. This lesbian feminism, I thought really, and I think the collective was, a, we all thought that, um, you know, if women knew about lesbian feminism, they would all come out, the world would change and that would be that pretty much in a nutshell. There were a few other minor things to be, you know, do like ending the patriarchy, but that pretty much that would happen. Um, so that was the constant, the music was a constant because we were in love with the music, with the artists, with, um, with, the, with the audience, you yeah. know, the audience. And seeing the audience, the audience response was, um, there was a concert that Meg did in Boston once, um, early days. And um, I mean, it was post, Olivia was going and, and she did a concert in Boston and it was in a big hall. It was like an 800 seat hall or something. And she came out on stage and was literally knocked back by the energy of the women in the audience who were just so excited and so um and, and it wasn't just, I mean, part of what was going on was um, the music and all of that, but it was, it was the community. It was women seeing themselves. It was women seeing others like them. And, uh, and it, and it was, and it was the beginnings of women seeing how big the community was. And that just kept growing and it, it keeps growing in a certain way. Well, uh, the other, I, you're going to ask me something. I know you will. But the, the, the other piece of that is I called a couple of people, 
just to say, you know, is there something you want us to talk about? And everyone I spoke to went, didn't even answer the question. They went right back to when they first heard an Olivia record uh -huh. and how it affected their coming out or how it, how it, you know, constant, this constant of how this thing that we were doing, the music was making such an amazing difference that, um, and that they fell in love with that part that we also fell in love with, which was creating this magical thing that was happening throughout the country. And it was, once we did Women on Wheels, it became like a, the consciousness spread all over the country and, and suddenly we're doing, we were doing major concerts everywhere. Yep. So. So I want to go stay with the music for a minute. Yeah. So it's 1975 now. Um, Meg's album is out. We finally get it out. <laughs> Overcoming a few hurdles, which I, I, I detail in the book. Um, and we're starting to do um, Changer, mm -hmm. uh, the Changer and the Changed. And Judy, you were the album coordinator right. for that. And so you were in the studio every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I have always wondered, well, actually I haven't always wondered. I, when we agreed to do this, I started wondering, did you have a sense, and do you think that the women, um, the musicians who were in the studio every day had any sense, had any idea about what the impact of that record would be or how important it was? Um, or was it just, you know, let's get this song done and go on to the next one? I mean, what was it like? Hmm. You know, that's a, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, it was, putting the music, recording the music. I think that was the focus for everyone who was there and um, doing in the, this in an unusual way that didn't, you know, that everybody was making it up as we were going forward. I mean, Chris, when we first started was the most knowledgeable about being in a recording studio. So all the women that came in there were just so excited to be able to work on a record together, to record together to, you know, the other thing that happened with that album um, is that when we first started doing it, we took Chris into the studio and she did her vocals and she did her piano or her guitar and she did her 10 songs and it took like one or two takes. And then we thought, oh, we're almost done because it was so beautiful and it took two days and it was pretty amazing. And then Chris called me. And she said, Judy, I need to talk to you, which happened not infrequently over the years. And she said, I, I can't make my album this way. I need a rhythm section. I need, <laughs> I'll, give me a week and I'll come back and we'll do it. So they, she went off and did that. And a week later they went into the studio and it was, uh, you know, Jackie Robbins and it was um, um, June Millington and, you know, it was just a really amazing thing that was happening. But the amount of recording experience of most of the people who came in was not very great. So it was a lot about, we have to, we have to take good care of Chris's music, I think was a lot of what was going on because they all loved Chris's music. And, um, and Meg was there who adored Chris and adored her music and um, just wanted to be as helpful as she could and be part of it. And I think every musician there just felt like they wanted to be part of it. I'll just tell you a quick story for me. The music was, it was amazing to be there. And because you could feel the music, you could feel what was happening there. And, um, but the thing that hit me the most was after it was over and I went to the mastering place and they were where they were gonna make the records. They were actually making the, um, the records. And I sat down with the guy who was, um, doing the mastering part in the record um, where they pr press the records and the acetates. And I sat there listening with him and he started to cry. Wow. And I just sat there, I'm getting chills now. I just went, oh my God, it's not just us. Anyone hearing this is gonna have this reaction. And that was, you know, that was the changer, you know? Yeah. So, and, and Chris did this during a time when she was, you know, breaking up with Margie, or they were breaking up and she had no place to stay and 
once again, she asked, can we, can I stay with you guys? And we had a little, we had a big doll, we call it a doll house, but it was a, you know, my, maybe six feet long and seven feet or eight feet wide. And we just, uh, Chris could just fit there with a bed and a TV and, and she stayed in the back yard in that house when we made the changer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was. And it, it changed was. the world. Look what this, this one album, along with Meg, Meg really was the performer that was beloved, absolutely beloved. And Chris, then we did Chris and it was like, it was like the, the waters party. <laughs> I mean, it was like, we just thought, oh my God, look what, so it was exciting. It, it was, it was. Mm -hmm. and, and if we had been a business, if we had been a, <laughs> a regular business, then we would have done Meg and then we would have done Chris and then we would have done Meg and then we, but we were so determined to not have um, the music, women's music yeah. defined by the particular style that they brought, which, you know, was basically acoustic soloists. Right. Um, and we so wanted to be a, to, the women's movement and the lesbian feminist movement and the music that we produced to really reflect a, a multi-racial, multicultural, multi-musical style of of everything, and so we, um, you know, went on to record. We did Bibi Karosh and Teresa Troll, and then we did Linda Tillery, which was another amazing experience and an amazing album. And Mary Watkins, who is, um, I don't know, just I think a brilliant musician. She's a genius. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Well, you know, I think when, when Twee came, Linda Tillery, that's her nickname, Twee is, when Twee came in, it changed so much of what we did, really, and, and Linda would say it was Linda and Sandy Stone because they, Linda would say that Sandy really helped her learn to be a producer. And yeah. so, and it was fun in the studio with them. It was a different kind of energy. It was this amazing energy. and. Um, and they, it, you know, it was this opportunity to bring it up at all a notch, the production, you know, I mean, the change, it was amazing for the moment that we created it. And as Chris continued to record, she had the opportunity to have more and more of that, the best production. Cause we spent a lot of money on production. We would make our albums. They were not done it cheaply. And we did them based upon the, what the artists, how the artists wanted to handle it. But Linda and with Sandy's help really took the production up, you know, and BB Crush is a great example of that. If you guys ever have a chance to listen to it, it's one of my favorite albums. I know it's one of Ginny's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and what's funny about that is that we spent a lot, we spent all of our money on production and nothing on promotion because we, <laughs> we didn't know how to do it. And for BB Karosh, we gave them a thousand dollar promotion budget, which was huge, <laughs> huge for us. And they, and you know, and you have to remember that in those days there was no social media and there was no email. If you wanted to make a phone call, a long distance phone call was expensive. So we thought they would, that's how they would use the money is, you know, they would make long distance phone calls and send out promotion. No, they bought a van so they could tour. And we thought that was, you know, ridiculous. But that our philosophy was, it's your album, and you get to, and it's your promotion money, and you get to take it where you want to take it. And that's what, and that's how they ended up in Oklahoma, rural Oklahoma, in the <laughs> middle of the night, at a hidden lesbian club, and um, that was a little problematic. But anyway, yeah. So, well, I mean, in those times, you know, we didn't know enough about money. We needed no. more money. We needed more money than we had. But, you know, one of the, I was thinking about all the things that were so exciting. I remember when we did the 45 in DC and we sent it out. We were going to have all these rich and famous women send us all their money by breaking the 45. And um, they didn't send us all their money. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but women all over the country, Meg and Ginny had been out there and Chris was out there and they, they were saying, well, where's the 45? We want to buy it. And we went, oh, that's a good idea. And we raised enough money to do our first album that way with a little help from a loan or it wasn't a loan, it was a gift that we got as well. But yeah. we made an album with $11,000. And then 
eleven thousand, including the pressing, and yes. then we and the jacket press and the jacket printing right. the jacket and the jacket, and then we we picked up and moved to L.A. We plunked ourselves down there. We started this record company in earnest. We made the changer. We, you know, it was just escalating in a brilliant fashion and. You, you know, you and Meg laid a, a, a foundation for it that was just so important. Um, and then, as you say in the, uh, you know, that we became a collective really when we moved to LA and it became clear that the Meg and Ginny show wasn't gonna, you weren't gonna be able to do everything. You were right. doing everything and then you couldn't do everything. And we were all there going, well, we wanna, we, we wanna do, it's just not sure what it is. So we started, divvying up what it is. And I took on the music and I took on the production, um, trying to find the right side of this shirt. But anyway, <laughs> my Olivia t-shirt, everybody, this is a modern day Olivia t-shirt. But anyway, um, we were trying to figure it out together. And we it was, you said this once, it was glorious because not only was it all working and that women were so excited and it was actually helping women in un we can't even begin to know you guys out there who are you know watching this we we so know how much this music meant to everyone and how olivia continues to have that thread of the entertainment and the music and there's a lot of women's music happening out there there's a lot going on today that that wasn't you know that uh that's exciting. There are many amazing artists, women artists that are out there. So um, my point being that really this, it was a magical moment in time and a year was like 10 years, right? The yeah. year, we did so much in one year and it felt like, you know, it, it felt time was different for us because we did so much in a short, short period of time with nothing, we had no money. We had no money. Whatever we had was from uh, fr from Meg going out on Meg and Jenny going out on the road and bringing money back, and we pooled our money, and we then the record started to sell. It was pretty yeah amazing. And what was amazing also, Judy, and I, I, this is this this comment that just popped up on the screen is reminding me of the way that um, we were not alone in this. Right. That we counted so much on the women's bookstores, of which there were lots and lots. Right. Um, what, who sold the records and displayed the records and played the records constantly in the store. If I had worked there, I probably would have been driven a little nuts by hearing them over and over, but they did it. And <clears throat> there was a very extensive um, uh, women's um, press, uh, you know, monthly newspapers that wrote about it. Um, and one of the things that we did also was um, there were not women's concert producers, and we just uh, called women up. We would find women. We would just find random women. I don't know how we found them. And said, sometimes it was our distributor who we would find when Meg and I would go on the road, and I would say, we need a distributor. Um, does anybody want to be a distributor? And then, you know, they would, fine, you're a distributor. And then we would call them up and say, do you want to produce a concert for Meg? And they would go, well, I don't know how to do that. And it's like, well, we don't know how to do it either. So, but here's what we know. Okay, get a haul, uh, print some tickets, put up some posters, we'll bring the sound, get some lights, voila, it's a concert. And, and in the process of doing this, and we were not the only ones doing this, but in the process of doing this, we created a, a concert production network all over the country that lots of artists, um, and I've heard I've heard Kate Clinton talk about this extensively about how it impacted her as a comic and mm -hmm. her being able to take advantage of that. So all of this stuff was happening there, and there were women's coffee houses and restaurants, and there was a um, just a a flourishing of women's culture. And um, I don't yeah. know, it was pretty amazing. It was all serendipitous, but also a lot of work and. Um, you know, uh, Dolores Huerta came on a cruise a few years ago and she turned to me and she said, Judy, I see it. This is not just a cruise. Olivia is a, it's, it's, it's genius activism and it's, it's bringing people together. 
and it's creating community and connection. And this is the this is the almost 50 year reality of Olivia. That's what the music did. The music was also for people who felt like they were the only lesbian or the only feminist where, where, where they were. And they were, people were so in the closet and they had a, a record that changed their lives. And that was, I mean, if it only happened for one person, how amazing. But this happened for hundreds of thousands of people for women. I mean, it was amazing. And the, you know, hi, Betsy York. I mean, for the, all the work done by the distributors, mm -hmm. who's making any money? Nobody was making money. <laughs> you know, I mean, we made $15 as we got $15 a week as a living collective, right? We made uh, as spending money as, and we paid all of our expenses and pooled all of our money, but we had an extra $15 a week that we got otherwise for well, years. We had who had time to spend it because all we did was work anyway. So, well, we did have a softball team. That's and true. We did go to karate together. Yes, and we, did. Uh, we had time. You know, some of us had time for new girlfriends every now and then. And oh, um, Judy, don't now don't be <laughs> humble about that, Judy. <laughs> it, remember, it was two couples and me, and that's the other thing. You know, we just put our hands in the circle, right? And no matter what, how how is it possible? For you, I read the part in the book about the heartbreak that happened for you, really. Because you and you and Meg did this. It wasn't just that you were together. You also created, this was a baby that was born. And so, when you know, we weren't even in LA that long before that there was that rupture that happened. Um, and I just wonder how, you know, I learned a lot from the book because you just seemed to just, Carry on. Yes, we did drink um, a bottle of scotch around the, the dining room table, and we woke up the next day <laughs> having collapsed. But it was a collective marriage, really. And so when that started to to you know things started to fall apart in terms of internally, we didn't let it affect the Olivia. That was a real tribute to this sense of responsibility for this thing we were creating and loved, yeah? Yes, I'm not sure that it was the healthiest thing that I ever did, but to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, because I was determined um, that I was not gonna leave Olivia. And so, um, and I did have a broken heart. And, um, and I do wanna say that that has long been long ago was uh, repaired and healed and, and uh, Meg and I are good friends. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think it's important to say that we, we made a lot of mistakes and this for me was a mistake was to um, not allow myself to feel my feelings and take some time to um, heal from this rupture and this, you know, this, this, uh, this wound. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, and I did it because I was, you know, because it was very clear to me that the most, and I said this for many years, that the most important thing for me was my political work and relationships were secondary. And, um, you know, when I survived and I'm fine and blah, 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 I don't want to bemoan this, but I don't think that it was the healthiest thing in the mm -hmm. world to just, right drink the bottle of scotch together, get horribly <laughs> sick and uh, and yeah. go on and try to act like, you know, everything is, everything's fine and we don't have to, yeah. we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to deal with it. Um, I, it's not something that I would recommend, but I will say, <laughs> Judy, that it was, um, it was a tribute to the rest of the collective that um, people didn't take sides people, um, people, the rest of the collective, meaning basically mm -hmm. the three of you, right. you and Kate and, and Jennifer held us yeah. um, and held the, held it while um, Meg and I were kind of spinning out mm -hmm. to the extent that we were. So. So do, I, I, I wanted to ask you a question about collective, oh, collective thought. Like we spent a lot of time talking and 
deciding what it, just about everything required a conversation. Was this the right thing to do? You know, did you wear blue socks this morning? Maybe that was I mean, not quite blue socks, but it was a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't have it all. You know, we were making it up as we went. But um, it was also there would be like my memory now is interesting because sometimes I'm not sure if I did it or you did it. I'm not sure if I said it or somebody else said it. Now there's certain things I'm absolutely sure of, but there were moments that I used to sit there going, it didn't matter, but it was, that's how enmeshed we were in what we were doing. And um, I don't think that there was, I think it was an amazing time. And that what was stirring out there in the world, you know, we couldn't have done this without, you know, all everybody who was involved. And, um, you know, <clears throat> it was also, we need to f forgive ourselves for those early days because a lot of people were crazy. I mean, yeah. angry and excited and scared. And there was a lot going on and just coming out or, you know, losing their children. I mean, there was so much happening and being in the closet and being out. I mean, having the artists come out on lesbian concentrate. That now was, that was, yeah, that was something. And that was, I just want to, can I just say, I know you're on a, you're on a roll no. here, but I just have to talk about how much fun it was to do lesbian concentrate in our, in our, um, in our uh, two houses. Um, Meg was in the studio doing her second 913. I, it was LF 913. Yeah. Can I remember the name of it? Was it face the music? Yes. Okay. And so we had a little studio time, but the rest of it, we set up in one living room. We had two houses next to each other. By now we had expanded. There were more of us. So we had two houses um, and an apartment. I think I was living in the apartment across the street after Meg and I broke up. But anyway, so, so there's Gwen Avery playing the piano. We rented a piano in one studio and Linda Tillery's behind a box of records, boxes, I mean, a pile of records, a tower of record boxes, which is the only thing we can make for a baffle. And she's playing the drums behind the, the tower of records and they're recording Sugar Mama. And Sandy Stone is in the next house with the little uh, console that she's invented, recording it all. And we're just like, it was, it was a, it was a great thing. And then we, we, I remember after the record was out and we made those little stickers, um, Lesbian Concentrate, with the great cover that Kate designed. I could pull it out in a minute for another visual aid, but I won't. Um, and we, so we had these Silent No More. And this was at, a, we went to Disneyland and this was at a time when Disneyland was very homophobic. They would not let you touch people of the same gender. And we slathered these stickers all over Disneyland, Silent No More, Lesbian Concentrate. That was a lot of fun to do that album. So for everybody, we made 100,000 stickers and we sent them out to just whoever and said, take these stickers and put them everywhere. And it was the orange juice can and it said Silent No More and put it in bathrooms in airports and you know anywhere you go and so this was it was it was about you know Anita Bryant and the you know what was going on in Florida and the the anti homo homosexual you know uh laws that were being created we in the middle of that this is so typical of us because what did we know we just sat there going this is really terrible what's happening in Florida what should we do and so i think Jennifer or Kate said Jennifer well, we're a record company. Maybe we should make a record. We both. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean, a lot of what we did was kind of silly, really. A way of coming to conclusions. That was just one of those moments where it was. Oh yeah, a light bulb. You know. Yeah. Hey, Pokey. Um, Judy, I have one more question. I know we're getting to the point where we're going to let other people ask questions, but I, I want to ask you one more question as you um, think back about those early days. Mm -hmm. What do you think surprises you the most? Or in that, even in that time, what surprised you the most? Wow. God, everything was a surprise. <laughs> I mean, and, and everything was expected. Everything was a surprise. Um, I think in the most positive surprises was how many records we were selling 
We didn't know what we were doing, but women were out there raising their hands to say, I'll sell the records in this town. You know, I, you know, um, you know, you get up on stage and say, who wants to be a distributor? And then three women would show up after the show. I mean, it was like, okay, you do it. We'll teach you how, you know? And, um, you know, that was one of the great things, Jenny, to mention that you did, which was to create that network of distributors who were phenomenal, wonderful people who just loved the music and wanted to help. And women who came, to, I'm just gonna talk about this for one second, women who came to the concerts and wanted to be part of it. You know, often we had to deal with the negativity, but the really the, the most important part is that the support of this company was beyond anything we could have and should have imagined. It was remarkable because we were feeding the community and the community was feeding us literally and figuratively. And this continued, it's still true today that you know there wouldn't be this ongoing Olivia thing that's happening because it's community and connection. And it's yeah. you see people, the light bulb go off for people on the trips who have experienced being amongst other women for the first time. And it is the same thing. It's the same feeling of, of you know, the stories are endless. They are endless. And I'm, I'm just so thankful that one Chris said, why don't y'all just start a women's record company? And that you guys went, oh my God, we're gonna go do that. And we were kind of on our way towards that, but that's it. And then you called all of us and said, come on over. And you of course were great at storytelling and drama in terms of the way in which you would present. And you said, okay, because she didn't tell us beforehand. She wasn't gonna tell us what it was. It was like, no, you have to come and I'm gonna paint the picture. We all sat down in that room and she said, with a national women's recording company. And what did we do? We went, a national women's recording company. It's, but Ginny went on to explain it and 10 minutes later, yeah. I was ready to give up law school. That was it and, and run off with two couples I didn't know. And because it was so right and we love those artists so much, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Do, do, should we, yeah, it's time for us to, Ginny, did you want to say anything to, I mean, we could go, this was so short, right? I know it was short, but I want to just, there's something I have to ask you, Judy. I've already, I've, I, this won't take long, I promise. One of the things that we um, did when we were in LA was um, once a week, we all had a meal together. Mm -hmm. And because there were 13 of us, whoever was cooking that week, that day, would spend the day, first you would go to the Ralph's, to the grocery store, and then you would cook this fabulous feast and then you would have to clean up. And that was all you could do. You're feeding 13 hungry women. Right. You made the best hot cabbage borscht. I want your recipe. I called okay. my Aunt Bella. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And now, I'm, now thousands of women know that I'm waiting for it and that you're going to get it for me. Thank you. I thought you were going to bring up the fact that on Thanksgiving, I made egg oh. Oh, I forgot that. I should have put that in the book. <laughs> okay. So we were, just to fill in that, so we were five and then we became 10 and 13 and 15 and we started to really grow. And uh, when we were growing in LA, it was like a family coming together and having, a you know, every afternoon for lunch, we would eat together and bring other people from the community would come. And we were really, we had now people were living in houses around the ground, other houses were starting. So we started to have like take over a whole half a block with yeah. Chris living there and, um, you know, Mary living around the corner. And we and just- Sandy Ramsey was in the house on the other side. Right. You know, thank goodness for the Sandy Ramseys and the Tam Martins and the Liz, you know, the everybody, Liz and everybody who came in those, you know, came to us over time. So it's truly amazing. So we will ask you now to send in your questions. And I hope there are um, some out there so that we can, uh, it's not, we can, we can so much I'm sure fun. we can fill the time. I'm Judy sure. and I, um, although we, we were very uh, key to the success of this record company, we're never allowed to sing actually, other than in some very large backup choirs. And it's always been, I'm, I've am i always, oh, and Chris Williamson wants the recipe as well. Okay, now there's some force behind it. Um, 
So, <laughs> and that was one of the choirs that I got to sing in. But so we'll fill, if you don't have questions, you know, we're going to just, who knows, we might sing. I have other questions <laughs> I can always ask. Okay. <laughs> Anybody? All right. Well, I'm sure we'll hear about it. What, Why Victoria was Olivia chosen as the name? <gasps> Oh, that's a yes. great question. Why was Olivia chosen as the name from Linda Gregory Duty? So Olivia was chosen as the name because, first of all, I wanted to name it. We, we thought about Siren Records, uh, both meanings of Siren, as in watch out, here we come. And also in the Sirens uh, in Greek mythology who drove men to their deaths with uh, their music. Um, but we rejected that as being a little aggressive, negative. perhaps, or negative or something. Um, and then we I wanted to name it Rutherford, uh, after Margaret Rutherford, who I don't know what that was about. Uh, but then Meg was had just read a book called Olivia, and it was by, uh, pseudonym, pseudonymously written by somebody named Olivia. Dorothy Dorothy Busey is striking. Okay. And it was one of those um, uh, lesbian love book novels. And it sounded good. It's mellifluous, Olivia. And so we that's how we got the name, Olivia. Well, and uh, just a little more to the story, if you don't mind. that um, Olivia in the story is a young girl who falls in love with the headmistress of her, the boarding school. And it's a first crush. And she uh -huh. writes in the preface how you know, wasn't sure she should put it out there, but she was sure she wanted to put it out there because it was real and it was beautiful. And I mean, so we decided we'd take Olivia with us on this journey, along with it being melodic and mellifluous, whatever, mellifluous, yes. Um, and then a bunch of, dec a dec decade or so later, I was in a bookstore and um, I was looking for the book and there it was. And every 10 years or so, they changed the cover of the book. And it re really does reflect the changes in our society. So I have about five versions in the office of this book. And the first, the second version, the version that we saw was this two women looking very leering at each other going, Olivia, the love that dare not speak its name. <laughs> and, that, and that was in 19, because she did it in 1949. So, and then years later, we found out that Eleanor Roosevelt went to the same boarding school and fell in love with the same headmistress. <gasps> See, I didn't know that. So a, a little shout out to Jennifer Woodall, one of the original collective members who's, hi Jennifer. We love you so much, Jennifer. We do. Sandy. Sandy. Another got, collective member. <laughs> uh. I know they wouldn't let any of us sing. We should, we should uh, sue somebody for that. that. Yeah. And you Why know, not? we weren't the greatest cooks, though. Jennifer was pretty good. Jennifer made great chiles rellenos. Judy, you made you made great borscht. I'm telling you, your <laughs> borscht was great. I don't know what I made because I don't think I knew how to make uh, make a lot of things. You know, I, I the other thing I just wanted to say. If, if do we have a, a question? Yes, um, okay. we have from Martha. How did you transform from records company to a travel company? Oh, that'll take a few minutes, but not too dissimilar from someone saying, why don't you all just start a record company? Um, we were doing these 15th anniversary concerts and I was gonna end the company because it was getting too hard after everyone left me all to myself. Oh. Uh, the collective. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, and, these concerts were so amazing. It was in Seattle and this woman comes up to me after the concert and says, God, this concert was so great. All the artists were there except for Meg. Wouldn't it be great to have a concert on the water? And I went, concert on the water, cruise, vacations for women. I can do that. And so I took all the money we had, which is something that I learned from the early days. Just take everything you have. It doesn't really matter. And, uh, asked uh, Rachel if it would be okay. And she said, mm, probably not, <laughs> but I couldn't, I, I had to do it. And she, you know, she understood soon thereafter. So, um, and so um, that's how it started. And I just sent a letter to the Olivia Records mailing list saying, I think you might want to be free to be yourself on vacation. And you have to set up now, you can't cancel and you have to send all your money now. And that was it, that started. 
what would have uh Yes, so from Betsy York, um, if lesbian concentrate was a response to Anita, what would Olivia produce today? Oh my God. Well, let me just say, let me just say, this is a typical Betsy York question. It is. Betsy York was one of our original and great distributors. Uh, I shouldn't say our distributor. She was, an, she was a great distributor. She had a, her own company whose name I can't remember, was it Hibiscus? I don't remember. Everybody had a everybody's company had a name. It was either a flower or a, a Greek goddess or something. Um, and um, she was she was a distributor in Boston, and she eventually covered most of New England. And she did a fabulous job. And then she moved to L.A. and um, and I don't remember much beyond that. And uh, Judy, did that give you enough time to figure out how to I, answer? I the really question? have thought about that, Judy. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do think that what we would do would be a lot of events and a lot of, you know, after after COVID, you know, we would bring everybody together. And I think that we'd bring the artists together to fight against the incredible, uh, all the what uh, what Trump unleashed is unreal. And so really, I think that Olivia has that responsibility still to uh, to bring people together so that they're not feeling so alone in their uh, in in the fight that has to take place. So I don't know, Ginny, what do you think? What would you? <laughs> well, I, I, that sounds good to me. I, I want to, I mean, what Trump unleashed, but I, you know, I have to say this really to me, this, you can go right back to Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And this was here. Actually, you could go back further to Barry Goldwater if you're old enough to remember that, um, that this, you know, Trump just took the lid off of something that has been festering um, for a long time. And I think that we would be uh, I don't, we wouldn't produce a record, I can tell you that, because, there, you know, that's not happening. But I think that the music and building community, and I, I think there's a lot that we would do different. I certainly would do a lot um, different if if I were going to do it. But um, the whole idea of building community and building relationships and making connection and um, uh, and tapping into our inner greatness, all of us have inner greatness and um, helping everyone bring that forward. That's what we would be doing. That's my answer. You know, um, the other thing that I wish, you know, if I was going back, and this is not answering Betsy, but if I was going back to those days, what would I want to see different? And honestly, what we did with nothing was pretty remarkable. Imagine what we could have done if we had a little more money or we had a little more, you know, a little more so that we could, you know, make a mistake. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we, we couldn't make, every time we made a mistake, it was, it was too big. You know, uh, we thought everyone would buy every record because it was Olivia and they didn't, it made sense, but they didn't. Um, you know, and we didn't know how to adjust or find people who had money to help us or whatever it would take. We just thought we would keep going the way we were going. And um, that made it hard for us. Um, you know, and, and that speaks to one of the one of the big contradictions, I think, that we had to deal with and um, which was that we were trying to. Uh, as much as we needed money, as much as we could have done with money, we didn't want to deal with money. We we didn't want to play in the capitalist system. We did not want to follow the rules. You know, like I said earlier, if we had been a, a real a real business, we would have done Meg and Chris, and then we would have done Meg and Chris, and then we would have done Meg and Chris, and we might have done a few other people, but that's how record companies operate. You have a... a um, Somebody who sells records, you keep recording them. You don't go out and record bands that nobody's ever heard of or um, musicians who are going to be unknown to most of your audience and have no money with which to promote them. Um, so we have these these um, these conflicts about how do we be how do we do everything that we want to do, which requires money while not charging 
not making huge profit on any of our records, not charging a lot for concerts, um, not do it, not playing in the, not playing the way we would have to play to bring in a lot of money. And it was a, I mean, it was a, it was a source of, uh, of constant tension and disagreement among members of the collective about which way should we go. And, um, and there was a time in the late seventies, I think, when we, it was a few months before Christmas, which was one of our biggest seasons, and we were broke and we owed our pressing plant gazillions of dollars. And we needed to re, and Changer was out of print and we needed more Changer. And he wouldn't press them because we couldn't pay our bill. And, um, and it was, I mean, it was, it, we came this close to going under. And then Liz Brown, who was um, doing a lot of the finances, figured out a way to make regular payments to him. So he, he would repress Changer and put out, it might've been, uh, might've been Mary Watkins album that we were, was the mm -hmm. new album. Anyway, but that's the kind of, it was that, um, you know, that um, contradiction that we were dealing with of being a successful feminist business, which did not mean being a, success, a successful capitalist business and in a, in a very capitalistic male industry, mm -hmm. to say nothing of the whole country. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we did the impossible and it was possible because we didn't know what we were doing and we believed in it so strongly. We just did it and it worked for quite a while. And yeah. even, even I think when it starts to get more difficult, I think that we all, we were trying, we tried really, really hard. I don't, I can't think of anything that we didn't try to do to make it work. And I think that we were experimenting, we were doing amazing things. We were, um, but at the same time, there was this community that held us up for very, really well and beautifully. And it, it uh, there was one question, Jenny, that we just had that said something about, I, I don't see it there anymore, but how do lesbian feminist artists, how do we, how do we keep that connection with them now that there is uh, more, Room. I don't know. Uh, the uh, The question isn't there anymore. Um, and I think that you know, my experience is, you know, Olivia is one of the few, um, you know, remaining institutions that is there creating community and making that happen and bringing all the artists, as many artists as we learn about, on 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 board, whatever trips we're doing to enable people to. Be aware of them, and they're from all over the country. People are from all over the country, and they bring people to their houses, and they do all that. I don't think we're out of the woods in terms of now that we are more. Uh, there's more of an awareness of us. I think that lesbians remain invisible and are going to have to continue to fight for that, even the label, lesbian. You know. Right. Um, and LGBT and queer is all good and all those labels. And we understand that this is like post, you know, um, oppression in terms of the, the gay community, but it isn't post. We can see that in a minute, it all goes away. So more institutions need to be there. More writing needs to be done. More music needs to be created. Um, yeah. Can I just say, and more books need to be written? Can I just yes. plug my book? Oh, wait, yes. Uh, it's a Olivia, really great book. Olivia on the record, a radical experiment in women's music. Aunt Loot Books is the publisher. They're a, a feminist, multicultural feminist press, and they're wonderful to work with. And um, okay, thank you. I did that. Okay, um, I think if there aren't other questions that we are, um, I, I mean, I hope other people enjoy <laughs> enjoy this talk as much as I hope. Jenny, hope you did. I know that I did. I did. I did. I, yeah. Um, we felt it was important to have this opportunity, and I just loved it. I thought a lot about it beforehand, and I'm just glad that you and I had this chance to get together. Yeah. I, I, let me just also say, Judy, I think it's great that we did this. I know it's been a long time since we've sat together and 
um, and talked like this. And um, I hope that we get to do it in person uh, yeah. someday. And thank you. And I'll thank Terry Lynn for whatever she's doing, all the things, the, the back end, the tech stuff. That's so important. And um, and thanks to Olivia for for uh, keeping on. And we love you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. We love you so much. Yes. And Karen, even Karen, even though you don't love, love you, Karen, me, I'm sorry that you don't love me, Karen, but I love you. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, hi. Hi. Hey, hi. Kind of at Are the we end here. I, Make I sure think everybody read Ginny's book, really. Yes. If you're interested in this time, it, it's such an important time. Uh, and Olivia's part in it was really very special. So, and Ginny really tells a good story about that. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ginny and Judy. Wow. And all of you viewers for being here because we just, we just got the inside scoop. So thank you so much. And um, I want to invite you to come back to join us on At Home with Olivia. Next week, we have actress, comedian, Margaret Gomez in her one woman show, Not Getting Any Younger. That's going to happen on Friday, April 2nd, 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. Have a good evening and we'll see you next week.